morning campers! It's another wonderful summer day here at Camp Bloodbath, where we have everything you could want for your summer horror needs. Beautiful nature, rampaging killers, a break from society, crazed cults, carefree romance, and unspeakable horrors set on cutting your still blossoming life tragically short. The horror genre isn't limited to any one aesthetic, but when you think of classic scary stories, you can't help but imagine cold nights, thunderstorms, full moons, and dark homes. It's these feelings of physical unease and a lack of safety that we've come to associate with horror. And there's something buried deep in our instincts that tells us to be afraid of the cold and the storm and the dark as essential for our survival. Aesthetically, horror films often match their appearances with their scares. Killers often strike at night, when potential victims are most vulnerable and their slayings can be easily hidden. The coming of danger is often signaled with the arrival of rain and lightning. Ghosts live in old, decrepit houses filled with shadows. Fall leaves and the Halloween season get us mentally ready for a story filled with supernatural fears and our worst nightmares coming true. But while it's easy for creators to use dark and stormy nights as shorthand for spooky tales, there's an inverse that I find fascinating. Summertime horror. Bright sunny days, carefree months away from responsibility, and beautiful nature often fill these stories and contrast hard against the danger, death, and life-altering events that come with summer set terror. Not every summer horror is explicitly set during the season, but instead gives the feeling of hot weather, free time, and new life colliding with death. And there's something about these specific stories that tickles my brain in just the right way. The vibes are immaculate, the settings are sublime, and the killers are filled with metaphor. But what does summertime horror speak to about our hopes and fears of adolescence, adulthood, and nature? What are some of the best hot weather horrors? And why does this seasonal terror have such a wonderful, exciting grip on us? Report to your bunks, campers. Horror season is here. Horror is a way for us to process our real fears about the world around us in a safe way. Ancient myths helped humans understand why the world worked in ways they didn't understand yet. Stories of ghosts, monsters, and all sorts of horrible things that lurked in the dark and dangerous parts of the land helped keep children from doing things that were unsafe on their own. Of course, there's no discounting the depths of human imagination, and what sparks our fears more than the deep, dark unknown? It's only natural for the modern horror film, novel, and TV show to lean into the tropes of gothic horror, even when in a modern setting. So when a horror story is set in broad daylight, not obscuring its fears, but instead putting them out in the open for everyone to see, it immediately sets itself apart. Not just in its aesthetics, but in what it's trying to say through its scares. Alongside daytime horrors come seasonal changes, and summer places the most stark aesthetic contrast to what we've come to expect. Naturally, with summer comes a different type of story. Stories of lazy days, road trips, parties, and irresponsibility. Alongside the setting, kids, teens, and young adults are often the victims and survivors of modern horror. Each age brings a different context. Teens are so often the focus of modern horror, but what is it that makes teenagers and young adults okay as potential victims? They're not all that distant from children, but kids are taboo. Meanwhile, the elderly are often used as figures of terror. Too young, that's sad. Too old, that's scary. But the young adult is the symbol of just enough life having been lived to be sad, but not too sad. And for the metaphorical death of the teenage years to be translated through the literal death that a killer or monster brings. When looking at summer horror, I see it divided into two categories that then branch into different ideas. One, summer abroad, where trips into the unknown, often some sort of wilderness, bring us into the territory of an animal, monster, or killer we would have never seen otherwise. Two, summer at home, where a season of freedom unearths horror next door. In either case, the vibrancy of life, the seemingly unlimited potential of the season, is brought to a sudden violent end. And those that survive the summer will move into fall, where life will never be the same. Vacation horror doesn't have to take place during the summer, but a group of family or friends traveling during the season is easy pickings for stories of cars breaking down and accidental encounters with many societies and monsters along the way. 
Toby Hooper's The Texas Chainsaw Massacre is probably the greatest example, and something that's inspired countless imitators. While Sally and her friends take their trip due to a case of deep Texas grave desecration, it's essentially a story of the end of the hippie movement, colliding with a rising tide of violence in modern America, as their road trip brings them straight into the den of the cannibalistic Sawyer family. Through it all, Hooper and company create an environment of sweltering heat and spoiling meat, mostly thanks to that being the actual filming conditions. Essentially, it's the worst aspects of summer condensed into a single film, and in doing so, corrupting the dream of innocence. Vacation horror is essentially the opposite of home invasion, with survivors traveling into the layer of horror instead of a killer violating the safe space of home. But I think Jordan Peele's Us is an interesting blend of the two, using a vacation to Santa Cruz to put our lead and her family back in a lake house where the specter of the past waits for them. Really, only the first half of Us uses the scares of home invasion, but the rest, with its beaches, boardwalks, and hidden underground layers, is fully immersed in summertime scares, fully juxtaposing the haves and the have-nots in this tale of America's downtrodden taking over. Also, don't ask me to explain the logic of us. I have no idea how any of this is really supposed to work. Actually, Peel's other two movies, Get Out and Nope, set a lot of their stories in broad daylight as well, with Nope in particular leveraging the American West in its alien attack narrative, the wide open ranges evoking freedom and possibility disrupted by something unknowable. Surprisingly, I find that hotel, motel, and rental horror movies often have little to do with the summer, either being set during the winter or having little to do with the season, although there's plenty to be plumbed from these settings too. Of course, when you talk about summertime horror, you can't leave out the specific subgenre of camping horror and the even more specific subgenre within it of the summer camp slasher. And really, you can't get much more iconic than the Friday the 13th franchise. Yes, I already did a whole huge video about these movies, and yes, this video is basically an excuse to talk about them again. Oh, and look, I'm going to talk about Evil Dead again, too. The original Evil Dead and the first Friday the 13th are the real trendsetters here, with Evil Dead solidifying the Cabin in the Woods iconography on one end, and Friday the 13th inspiring countless copycats of madmen and women on the loose in a summer camp on the other end. Evil Dead and Evil Dead 2, the greatest movie of all time, just ranking above Predator, Kiki's Delivery Service, Chungking Express, and Before Sunset, are a little more ambiguous about their time period, especially given that Raimi's original was made during a prolonged and grueling winter shoot. But that general setup of friends looking to have a good time free from responsibilities is summer horror to a T. Mostly, I think of it as being here because of the many cabin stories it set in motion afterwards. Camping horror, in particular, evokes fear of the natural world, and humanity gone feral when removed from the structures of society. Several years ago, I made a video about the fears present in the creature feature, where natural horror, in the form of some sort of recognizable animal, pushes back against humanity's dominance. And there's no movie that better melds summer setting and animal horror than Steven Spielberg's Jaws. While it's a big shark that presents the literal danger in the story, it's the summer and the town of Amity's dependence on tourism that endangers everyone in Jaws. Those beautiful beach scenes filled with happy, laughing families are so tense because we know what lurks under the water, while few people beyond Sheriff Brody do. And the movie carries that tension the entire time. Even out on the high seas with Quint, Jaws is warm and bright like a summer day. The human threat in Jaws is more of a societal fear, with Amity's mayor putting his reputation and the town's finances above the physical well-being of its people. It's the fear that people in power won't really look out for our needs, undercutting the carefree nature of the season with an innate lack of trust. And since the Piranha films are essentially Jaws copycats, you can place all that same imagery on this film series too. No summer, no real threat. Within the woods, the removal of societal norms often leads to horror stories about rural, wild people. A cliché for sure, but films like Just Before Dawn, Wolf Creek, Wrong Turn, and more use those hillbilly horrors to highlight the animalistic nature within all of us. To survive, final girls and guys in these films often have to become just as bestial as those hunting them. 
fight or flight, the prey drive, carnivorous impulses. If these took place in the dead of winter, then sheer survival would be a reasonable excuse. Set in the middle of a lush summer, and it's much more disturbing. The classic slasher has little to do with any sort of survival instinct. Instead, it's all id-driven rage, targeting youth living their lives to the fullest. Combine that with wild summers, and it's basically a wonderland for your icons of fear. With most of its slashing taking place on Friday, June 13th, Sean S. Cunningham's original Friday technically takes place right before the start of summer. But I think we can excuse this one. With the next three films happening right after one another in the midst of a summer spree across a few days. The original, of course, has Pamela Voorhees killing young counselors as revenge for the drowning death of Jason punishing sex and drug use after her mind has snapped. And the idea of a middle-aged mom taking the lives of young adults with their whole lives ahead of them feels like the adult world denying this group of teens trying to play adults when there's no one else around to take care of them. Jason, of course, is the icon, but Pamela is infused with a little more meaning. As the series went on, Friday and Jason would move further away from the woods and the summer. But I always found that Jason needed to be in the wild, or at least on the fringes of society. The specter of backwoods rage, punishing modern norms that trespass into his territory. The summer camp is, essentially, the safe breakaway from normal life, where the wilderness is tamed and reality takes a break. Jason is punishment for the lack of responsibility that kinda took his life. By the time we're taking cruises into New York and being a giant evil worm that jumps from host to host and fighting Freddy Krueger for a slasher supremacy, all that summer fun is long gone. Oh, I can't stay mad at you, Jason Takes Manhattan. In the wake of Friday's success, a whole mess of summer camp horrors popped up, both in the 80s and the decades following. The Burning and Madman both pulled from the New York boogeyman legend of Cropsey, with The Burning in particular using a camp prank gone wrong as the genesis of its killer. Sleepaway Camp is one of the most messed up slashers I've ever seen. But its story of bullying and abuse within a teenage setting and that final reveal, you know the one, you never forget it, makes it more disturbing than the average slasher because its horrors feel way more real. Not just the horrors of our mystery slasher, but everything from the pervert cook to the crazy bullying going on in what should be a fun getaway for the kids. Essentially, every summer camp slasher is indebted to Friday the 13th. The urtext of camp counselors and sometimes campers stalked by a crazed killer, sometimes from the woods, sometimes from within their own ranks. Cheerleader Camp, They Slash Them, Fear Street Part 2, Summer Camp, You Might Be the Killer, The Final Girls, Bloody Murder, Twisted Nightmare, I Could Keep Going, I'm Not Gonna. Some twist more than others. Some play it more straight. In any case, the summer camp, despite its lack of responsibility, acts like a mini society pressure cooker. With close quarters sparking romance, teenagers forced into parental roles, and the slasher of your choice being the real world crashing down on all those carefree young lives. The iconography has been set for decades to a degree that it's a comforting, fun trope that requires little explanation from the films that use it. And since we're out here, removed from society, surrounded by all sorts of nature-loving dang-ass freaks, let's talk about Midsommar. With its central summer solstice festival, travel to a foreign country, natural setting, and ever-presence of bright, warm daylight, Ari Aster's film is taking all of the summer horror themes and concentrating them to a hallucinogenic level. It's even propelled by a group cut off from society and carrying on their own violent traditions. It's just that instead of cannibalism or hillbilly aesthetics, it's a Swedish commune living out Scandinavian pagan traditions. Still got some inbreeding, though. This is folk horror where danger and death are cultivated from ancient customs and fears out of step with modernity. Think The Wicker Man or Witchfinder General. And instead of the season being just the setting, it's the propelling force of it all, compelling our cult to worship and sacrifice. In nature, summer is the height of life's abundance. Everything in full bloom, every life at height of its vibrance. Summer stories are naturally about embracing life. So it's no wonder that horror and its many deaths strike such a hard contrast, like a moment of winter in the midst of the solstice. Midsommar is essentially a breakup film about embracing the future and killing the grief-filled past. A story about recognizing what's holding you back and living life to the fullest surrounded by people rooting for you. It would be pretty uplifting if it wasn't for all the sacrificial murder, ritualistic suicide, and madness. 
Oh well, just gotta let go of the past, Danny. You know, you try to put on a nice summer festival for your rural village and suddenly there's drug-fueled dance competitions, or a hideously burned groundskeeper with some shears, or a mom that just can't let things go and people say you're the bad guy. I'm trying to run a business here. I'm hurt, and I'm old, and I'm tired, and I work with children. On the other side of natural horror is desert-based scares. Instead of nature being a beautiful place filled with life that may frighten you, horror in the desert is all about the inability of life to survive. Warm, comforting weather is replaced by grueling heat and blazing sun. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre and The Hills Have Eyes are hot, sticky, and desolate with their stories revolving around road trippers falling prey to families who have been separated from society and devolved into insane, cannibalistic hunters. It's in these stories where the heat plays just as much of a role as any killer. Personally, I've driven to Vegas and through all those parts of California where no one would want to stop, and the simple idea of being stuck in these tiny towns in the middle of nowhere is nightmarish enough. And that's why I think Tremors is the perfect hot summer desert movie, with the tiny town of perfection suddenly fighting for its survival against the unearthed graboids, cut off from outside help and improvising to survive. I love the design and characterization of the Graboid, but it wouldn't work as well in any other location. The hot summer sun, the barren flat plains, the weirdos. I love it. Move the summer out of the wild and back into everyday society and you get stories of people with too much time on their hands, stumbling on the darkness lurking within the homes around them. Alfred Hitchcock's Rear Window is the perfect example of this, with its story of broken-legged L.B. Jeffrey's curiosity getting the better of him as he stumbles onto a possible murder right outside his window, with its fully constructed apartment courtyard in the Paramount lot and incredible hot summer atmosphere. Hitchcock evokes sweltering lazy days at home, as seen through the eyes of our lead voyeuristic character. It's that unstoppable, unavoidable heat seeping through every inch of Jeff's home that makes him and just about every character on screen stir crazy, with all sorts of secrets and desires bubbling over as a result. Hitchcock was never one to focus on teenage characters. Instead, his films picked apart adult characters' psychology and relationships, all at the forefront of Rear Window. Movies like It, Summer of 84, Disturbia, and The Lost Boys all center on kids and teenagers with too much time on their hands, which leads them directly into the clutches of a monster or killer. It's this sense of having a world of possibilities ahead of you, not just in a summer with no responsibilities, but in the entire life that lies ahead, cut short by something terrible that creates the dramatic tension and stakes in these coming-of-age horror stories. Those that survive are never the same again, and find that childhood and its innocence are gone forever. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing just depends on the outlook of the movie. The childhood portion of It is sort of the perfect encapsulation of this type of story, slamming its kids on bikes adventure into the murderous Pennywise, who acts as the embodiment of childhood fears that must be conquered to grow up. King specifically connects his story to the season early on, describing the time in Derry. It was one of those perfect summer days which, in a world where everything was on track and on the beam, you would never forget. But personally, I love The Lost Boys. All sweaty 80s beachside drama and cool vampires in a story that never takes itself too seriously, but is always translating childhood and teen anxieties about growing up and fitting in through its campy horror. It's kinda perfect in that imperfect sort of way. A drunk driving accident at the end of high school haunts the characters of I Know What You Did Last Summer when they return home, keeping them from ever really being able to escape their high school lives. And actually, I Know takes place across three different summers, so I guess you could say this is the ultimate summer horror movie. The most summer for your buck, really. I mean, it's not good, but it does invoke those recurring themes of the end of innocence, thanks to a hook-using killer targeting our end-of-teenage protagonists. These summer-at-home horrors aren't about nature or escapism or vacations. And because home is always in sight, everything that happens disrupts the safety and happiness of our youth. Beyond the underlying themes of summertime horror, I'm just a really big fan of the look and feel. Warm tones, deep forests, bright oceans, long sunsets, and a fun atmosphere are often everything I look for when I want to have fun with a movie. Escapism experienced by characters inside an escapist movie. Not every horror movie has to interrogate our deepest, darkest fears. Sometimes they can just use them to give us that endorphin rush we need. 
It's part of the reason why I keep returning to the Friday the 13th series, and movies like The Lost Boys and Rear Window. The atmosphere is pitch perfect for bringing summer inside at any time of the year. But every summer must come to an end. And it's the end of the season and the sudden onslaught of real life that plenty of horror films directly deal with, both explicitly and implicitly. 1981's Madman takes place on the final night of summer camp, with a late night ghost story spiraling into a mythic killer's return spree, with camp counselors navigating messy relationships and the return to normal life before their lives are so rudely ended. Of course, Madman isn't like good at all, and is basically just doing Friday the 13th Part 2, and had to be rewritten when the burning beat it to making a story about Cropsy. But that end of summer feel is what's most interesting to me, and something I think It Follows did perfectly. With its story basically an STD slasher, It Follows is all about our leads suddenly terribly becoming aware of their own mortality, as brought on by sexual intimacy and the realization that sex with someone can be more vulnerable than you ever imagined. Aesthetically, It Follows is very gray and cool, but consistently features swimming pools and beaches contrasted against dying leaves. It's the last gasps of summer, the final moments before it gets too cold to go swimming. The death of the season, the death of youth, the death of innocence, all there behind the more present, literal fears of our characters. What I love most about horror is the paradoxical nature of it all. For so many stories about the dangers of the world, the horrible things that could happen at any moment, they make you feel so alive. And if summertime horror teaches us anything, it's to embrace our lives while we still have them. Because before you know it, they'll be over. Thanks for watching today's video, and if you're watching this on the day of its release, today is the first day of summer, and I thought that right now would be the perfect time to highlight this very specific niche in the genre. Over the last few years, as I've continued to go deeper and deeper into horror analysis with my channel, I've realized that some of my favorite horror movies are set during the summer, even though it's the opposite of what you'd come to expect aesthetically from the genre. And to me, there's something that's so, so special about summer horror, as well as daytime scares and hot horror overall. Put them together and you have these really interesting stories about the end of youth and innocence, seen through the lens of carefree days and horrible killers. To me, that contrast can make a really, really exciting story and be really unforgettable and not interchangeable with so many other stories. Of course, I love the Friday the 13th franchise and Rear Window is my favorite film from Alfred Hitchcock. And Rear Window was actually the subject of the very first video that I ever did on this channel. And to me, the summer season and those movies are hand in hand. And of course, I love Jaws. Jaws is also my favorite Spielberg movie. So I think you can see why my brain was so focused on summer horror. And now with the season upon us, I thought, why not? And in the course of this video, I talked about a lot of different subgenres as well. Camping horror, natural horror, creature features, summer camp slashers, road trip horror, hotel and motel horror. They all kind of cross over into that summertime aesthetic, but not all of them. It's an interesting Venn diagram altogether. And I think it says a lot about how we like to have our horror stories excite us and be very escapist in a lot of ways, but to also have some underlying themes in it as well. And summertime, youth, and the end of summer and our childhood, as seen through horror, is very interesting to me. Because to face fears, acknowledge them, and to reconcile with them, and hopefully conquer them to some degree, is part of growing up. There are a lot of movies that fall into this category, but I do have some of my favorites. In addition to the ones that I have already said, I really enjoy Cabin in the Woods, Sleepaway Camp, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Friday the 13th Parts 2, 4, and 6, but I like that series overall, of course, The Final Girls, The Burning, It Follows, Midsommar, Just Before Dawn, The Lost Boys, and the raft short portion of Creepshow 2. That's the only good part of Creepshow 2. The first Creepshow is so much better. I'd love to hear some of your favorite summertime horrors as well, and what you think about this interesting subgenre overall. As always, a huge thank you to my patrons for their continued support, and if you'd like to be a patron, it's only a dollar a month for early access to every video and exclusive Patreon-only reviews. That includes a monthly wrap-up of what I've been watching and reading and playing, as well as an exclusive Patreon-only review voted on by patrons every month, with the latest being a review of the graphic novel Seconds by Brian Lee O'Malley. 
And until next time, I hope that you're taking care of yourselves and making the most of your summer.